This is part one of a seven-part series on ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality. Part one discusses dilution ventilation and IQ. Let's start with this. Indoor air quality, what does it affect? It primarily affects occupant well-being, right? That's why we're doing this. Health and productivity. But it can also affect your risk management, engineer owner liability, and it also can significantly affect facility operations and particularly energy consumption. When we look to uh, steps to acceptable indoor air quality, we want to just do the basics here. We don't have to completely understand all of this, but we need to have a basic understanding of the contaminants of concern. There's building generated, there's biological, there's outdoor generated, and there's occupant generated. And what can we do about it? Well, there's three things we can do about it. And uh, I like to take the liberty of using the three R's, even though it's not technically correct, particularly at the, for the last one. But we can reduce the contaminants, we can remove the contaminants, and we can replace the contaminants, which is really more properly called dilute the contaminants. But I like the three R's, because then you can remember the three R's. You know, So you can do those three things. And then uh, we really don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel here, um, whether or not you believe the standards are, are completely accurate or not. They are our standards. We do have codes and we do have uh, high performance building rating systems. And the ones that you see here are the primary ones. OK, so we can follow these applicable industry standards, codes and rating systems. Um, when we take a look at understanding the contaminants of concern, when we take a drill down a little bit more, the building generated, we basically will have VOCs, but we can also have other chemicals on the biological side. We can have within the building envelope in intake plenums and in supplier plenums. And until recently, those were all moisture-based type contaminants, molds and fungal growth, okay? That's what we're talking about there is biological. And in the outdoor generated, we talk about via the HVAC system. Well, that means we have um, poor filter integrity, so we may be bringing in untreated outdoor air there. Through doors and across the building envelope is more pressure related, meaning bringing uh, untreated, unfiltered outdoor air in across the building envelope because the building is, uh, is negative. And then finally, we have occupant generated, which I think far too many people concern themselves only with the occupant generated side, which is primarily body odor or human bioeffluence. Uh, with COVID-19, things have changed a bit here, so we have airborne pathogens, and whether you consider them a biological contaminant or an occupant-generated contaminant, it really doesn't matter. It's something we never had to consider before, and now we have to consider it, and that has really created a lot of problems because our building codes and standards and, and everything we're working with today were never uh, designed to handle uh, airborne pathogens. So let's just look at the basics here. I like, I like to do things real simple. So this is an occupied space and those, those red circles represent some type of contaminant. They could be COVID, okay? And um, you know, you most likely will go into a space and there will be some level of contaminants there when you go into the space. And if we have no outdoor air for dilution or uh, any kind of targeted high level filtration, meaning filtration that actually can uh, remove the contaminant, what will happen is the contaminant level will just continuously increase. And I think that's really the case today with COVID, particularly in residences, because we really don't have uh, any real requirements for outdoor dilution ventilation in residences, and we have really poor filtration in residences. So I think that's what you're seeing in residences. And so what we can do about it is the number one thing I think we can do about it is dilute it. And, uh, and I think everybody kind of understands this. We take outdoor air, we bring it into a space, it's going to dilute whatever contaminants are in the space, including COVID, and then they're either going to be force exfiltrated, relieved, or exhausted out of the building. And you will get to some type of steady state um, level of your contaminants by bringing in outdoor air. And the thing is whether or not, what is the proper amount of outdoor is really what the question is. Uh, I think and ultimately what you want to do is you want to do a combination of outdoor air for dilution and you want to do uh, recirculated air that gets filtered. I, I also think though, I'm very concerned about folks that right now are saying, well, let's put in some 
uh, air cleaning uh, equipment and uh, hey let's reduce the outdoor air I think that's really dangerous and foolish to be honest with you but um, but the idea of using high level filtration and outdoor air the combination of the two is really what we're going to do how many people really feel concerned right now sitting outdoors uh, during COVID no, really even I don't okay I'll go outside and, and, and hang out and uh, but I, I don't like being inside buildings right now okay um, now, when we talk about the uh, standards, codes, and rating systems, they all require that outdoor air ventilation rates be maintained for compliance. So we have standard 62, which is uh, ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality. That's the one that we really have to go by. And then the IMC, the International Mechanical Code, one form of it or another has been adopted in most of the United States. And basically, uh, what, we're, what we have going on with the IMC is when you look at the ventilation side of it, it's really a strict interpretation of the ventilation rate procedure of standard 62. It's not the indoor air quality procedure and it's not some other procedure. When we get into uh, green construction, um, we have standard 189, which now is mirrored into the uh, International Green Construction Code or the IGCC. And it's actually identical in terms of verbiage, it's just the numbering system is different. And then when you take a look at rating systems, things like LEED, they really look a lot like 189, okay? So that's what we pretty much have. They're all based on ventilation rates. Um, there is a little bit of a conflict here, though, because when you take a look at 90.1, which is really getting a lot of, you know, 90.1 is really followed uh, throughout the country and the world. And one of the problems I have with 90.1 is it kind of goes against ventilation in a way. Everything it's doing is trying to reduce ventilation rates and save energy. And um, I think it really is somewhat of a problem, and, and, I, and I hate to say this, but in my opinion, it's created some of the problems we have today, particularly as a result of its requirements for demand control ventilation. And to be honest with you, there is, uh, there's, public review documents out there now we're trying to even expand demand control ventilation so uh, we're gonna have to be uh, really cognizant and concerned about where this might be going uh, when we go back to standard 62 uh, I don't I'm not going to cover it in great detail today I have uh, some very detailed presentations but they're not in this series and uh, when we look at the ventilation rate procedure uh, what I'm showing here is uh, basically the ventilation rate procedure is a very, it's very prescriptive, right? It's a prescriptive design procedure in which outdoor intake rates are determined based on space type, application, occupancy level, and floor area. It's not really subject to interpretation, all right? Uh, the indoor air quality procedure is, and uh, the current version of the indoor air quality procedure is very weak. And so there's been this, uh, addendum out, addendum AA for a while now, that's trying to make the indoor air quality procedure more substantial, but there, it's getting a lot of pushback. Um, and the reason it's getting a lot of pushback, quite honestly, is because it's trying to make the indoor air quality procedure more substantial. So I took this out of addendum AA. Um, a lot of this particular portion of the, of the standard is very similar in what it says in the current document. But I want to just go through this. The IQ procedure is an alternate ventilation procedure that shall determine the necessary rate of outdoor airflow. I, I'm running to so many people that don't think that airflow matters with the IQ procedure. And it's like, yeah, it's just it's a different way you come up with the outdoor airflow rates. To maintain concentrations of design compounds and particulate matter in the indoor environment at concentrations less than design targets, based on indoor and outdoor sources, air cleaning, and other variables. Goes on to say, indoor concentrations and outdoor air requirements shall be calculated with mass balance equations. And I think one of the things here that really concerns some people, and it shouldn't, is verification of satisfaction shall be performed after the building is completed and occupied. So that, that's the addendum A. a text. And, uh, but anyhow, you have two procedures, the ventilation rate procedure and the IQ procedure, and you have to select one to operate within, okay? Now, when you look at the uh, IMC, and uh, this is the IMC 2018, but again, going back, to, regardless of what version of the IMC you've adopted uh, in your state, 
uh, pretty much all is still referencing the same ventilation requirements of standard 62 because those ventilation requirements changed in 2004. All right, and they really haven't changed since. So when you look at uh, the mechanical ventilation requirements of the IMC, it says the minimum outdoor airflow rate shall be determined in accordance with section 403.3, which is if you sit the IMC ventilation requirements next to the ventilation rate procedure, you'll quickly realize that they're the same thing. Okay, they have the same basic requirements. All right, and I want to make sure everybody understands that. Because I have people say to me all the time, well, I don't care about Standard 62. It's like, well, you should care about Standard 62 because it's really what your code is based on. All right, and um, so we go back to Standard 62. I'd like to point this out. It's within the last several years now. But uh, Addendum Q approved one change that I think is very significant, and it's what I have underlined here. It says, the ventilation air distribution for VAV and multi-speed constant volume applications shall be provided with means to adjust the system to achieve at least the minimum ventilation airflow under any load condition or dynamic reset condition. It had always only been VAV, but the fact of the matter is we have multi-speed constant volume systems now as, as the norm, whether they be constant volume air handlers or multi-speed fan coils or whatever it is, multi-speed is pretty common right now and it's, there's a reason for that, okay? So you have to do some type of active control of outdoor air ventilation rates on most of these systems. You just can't set it and forget it. And um, also when you look into a Denim Q, this kind of goes along with what I was just saying, uh, all systems shall be provided with manual or automatic controls to maintain not less than the outdoor air intake flow required by Section 6, which are those two procedures, under all load conditions or dynamic reset conditions. So, you know, on VAV as load varies and uh, on uh, DOAS systems, I'm not sorry, not on DOAS systems, but on, um, on DCV systems as dynamic reset conditions vary, okay? And then it goes on to say that systems with fans supplying variable primary air, um, so that could be variable speed fan coils, shall maintain no less than the outdoor air intake flow required for compliance with Section 531. I think, you know, this is just things that you need to be point out. These are some small changes that have happened in Standard 62 over the past two years. They're small but large. Um, so it, the scope of where you need to do some type of active and dynamic control has become more, it's broader than it was uh, several years ago. All right, and the reason for that is this requirement under standard 90.1, which is each cooling system shall be designed to vary the supply fan airflow as a function of load. All right, so that's really what is driving this variable speed. All right, so it's not just VAV anymore. Okay, now I, I put this in for the IMC for a couple of reasons. One, so you can see the IMC, but also so that you can see how close the IMC is to what standard 62 says, if you're not already aware of that. So ventilation air shall be provided with controls designed to automatically maintain the required outdoor air supply rate during occupancy and then variable air volume system control, which obviously is going to have to be modified now to end multi-speed constant volume. The IMC will lag behind um, ASHRAE standards, right? Variable air volume air distribution systems shall be provided with controls to regulate the flow of outdoor air to maintain the flow rate of outdoor air over the entire range of supply air operating rates. That looks just like standard 62, doesn't it? Except that it doesn't say multi-speed uh, constant volume. All right, so I'm going to go back and date myself a little bit here, um, but on the other hand, this paper really changed uh, things for us in the way a lot of people uh, looked at outdoor air. So, uh, you know, I started back in the 80s at, at Ebtron, and back then everybody was setting fixed minimum position dampers on VAV systems, and as the VAV systems turned down, the ventilation rates turned down, and we really had an air quality problem, okay? So this paper was published in January 1990, and it was published by David Solberg, myself, and Len Damiano. But the, the truth of the matter here is David Solberg was the real, you know, brains behind this paper. So it was his paper, and, and uh, Len and I kind of went along for the ride back then in 1990. But it's a really good paper, and I like to, I like to use it even today, 30 years later, because it's still relevant. So let's take a look at it. 
Okay, so what we have going on here is uh, this is just a basic, simple air handler with only, only having a supply fan. And the reason I do it with a, only a supply fan is just the easiest way to understand this. And we have a fixed minimum intake damper uh, where the outside air is coming in that was basically set up by test and balance. And we're going to say it was, it was set up perfectly. And what happens here is on multi-speed and VAV, uh, say we have the supply fan running at its maximum speed right now, and that's when you set up for the outdoor air. So you have a particular outdoor airflow rate. If you cut down the, the uh, supply air fan uh, flow rate, what you're going to find is that the outdoor air on a fixed damper system is going to linear, linearly track the supply air so that it's going to drop. All right. And graphically, a way to look at this is what I'm showing you here. So the, uh, the red line is basically showing you the intake airflow rate. So we have on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, uh, on the x-axis there, we have supply airflow. It goes from 0 to 100%. And our, um, on the right vertical axis, we have the outside airflow, which goes from 0 to 100% of whatever our set point was. So we basically set this system up at 100% supply fan airflow, and that's 100% of our set point. And what we would find is if we uh, had a fixed damper system and we simply reduced the supply airflow by, say, it went from 100% to 60%, uh, uh, the outdoor air would go from whatever it was to 60% of where it was. And that was a big problem, and, and that was recognized back in this paper. Um, and so a lot of people understand that today. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody does because it's not just VAV. Like I said, it's multi-speed constant volume would have the same the same problem, right? So what I want to look at, though, in this example, is, and it's going to be example specific, okay, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, is that um, when we look at the uh, pressure drop across the louver or the hood and the intake damper at its fixed position, we're going to get a certain pressure drop, okay, at the, the, the design or 100% uh, intake flow rate. And we're going to get a certain pressure drop with it. And then as we uh, reduce the supply air fan speed, we're going to find that that mixed air plenum pressure is going to drop, all right? And, you know, as the flow drops, the, the associated uh, mixed air plenum pressure drops with it. And I want to know how much it dropped, okay? And it's pretty straightforward to look at it. Um, what you'll end up having here is with this... 40% reduction in the supply airflow on this example, we would get about a two tenths of an inch change in the mixed air plenum pressure. Now, what is this example? Well, this example assumed that the pressure drop across the louver or hood and the damper at its uh, fixed position was three tenths of an inch. So that if you measured the mix, mixing box plenum pressure to the outside of the building, it would be negative three tenths of an inch. And the reason I say this example is, um, is, is, is dependent on what we're doing here is that there are many, many uh, packaged uh, air handling units where the pressure drop across the louver and the, uh, or hood and the damper is much less than three-tenths of an inch uh, at minimum. And on those systems, the, uh, what I'm going to show you would be worse than what I'm going to show you. And then there's other built-up systems uh, or min-max systems where the pressure drop is greater. And if the pressure drop is greater, what I'm going to show you is going to be not as bad. Okay. All right. So we just picked three tenths of an inch because it's actually a pretty reasonable, reasonable uh, pressure drop over the, this intake system. So two tenths of an inch drop was a 40% reduction in airflow. Again, most people seem to realize that this changing of uh, fan speed or fan, uh, supply fan airflow is a problem, okay? But what they don't seem to always understand is that it's not just the pressure change in the mixed air plenum that creates a problem, right? It's, if it's a fixed orifice, you know, louver or damper, then it doesn't matter which side of the damper the pressure change is on. So we're going to go and look at now what happens when there's an 18 mile an hour direct wind to an 18 mile an hour crosswind. And when you take a look at that in this example, you get roughly the same uh, two tenths of an inch change. So that if you were to have operated this system with an 18 mile an hour direct wind and a fixed damper and came back and 
and uh, check the outside airflow at uh, when there was an 18 mile an hour crosswind, even if the fan speed was constant, so it doesn't have to be VAV, even if the fan speed is constant, you would have seen this two tenths of an inch change. And in this example, we would have seen the same 40% reduction in the outdoor airflow rate. This has nothing to do with fan speed changes. We've been trying to get people to understand this for a long, long time. That it's not just fan speed changes that you have to deal with. You have to deal with the fact that the building is really in a world that there's an external environment we have to consider as well. And this is actually some test data from our uh, facility where we're, you know, we, we're fairly well instrumented, as you would imagine, and we also measure uh, outdoor air, um, the wind speed and direction. And so what goes on, what we, what we did is we set it up one day when there was really no wind, and uh, it was a calm day, and that's what that's 100% set point where this uh, black dashed uh, line is. So 100% set point on a day when there was no wind, and then um, we found, you know, another day went by where we had a 15 mile an hour crosswind on the side of the building. So we set everything up exactly the same and we said, okay, let's monitor the outdoor air. And what we saw was about this 18% reduction in the outdoor air intake flow rate, which is what we expected to see uh, because we now have a, uh, a negative pressure slipstream effect going down the side of the building, making a negative pressure on that intake system. And I also want to point out that you see all that scatter, and people don't really always understand the scatter, but it's just one thing you need to understand about outdoor air intakes. Wind speed and direction are not, they're not constant and steady. They're variable. You'll have wind gusts and you'll have variable direction in wind. And actually, when you, on windy days, when you look at outdoor air intakes, you'll find that they will get variation because your dampers can't possibly respond fast enough to compensate for the wind gusts. That really should make you think about how you control outdoor air. In fact, when we talk to people about controlling outdoor air, we're like, when you look at it and monitor it, we want you to look at running averages, say two minute running averages of the outdoor air. But we also want you to control on the actual real time data, but understand that you have to slow the output of your control loop down. Otherwise you'll have hunting because you'll never ever be able to compensate for the wind gust and direction variability that you'll see. So that's kind of like a little sidebar note here, okay? But here's the bottom line is, this wind pressure is a big problem and it's not just a little change, okay? And uh, another thing that's a big change is going to be stack effect. Now people think about stack effect and high rises and how it actually affects building pressure, but they don't often think about how it affects outdoor air intakes. So what I want to show you here is very simple. Here we have a four-story building, and I'm showing you an air handler on the roof that's serving up the first floor, and I'm not showing the supply side. That's just a return air duct coming back to the unit. First thing I want to point out to everybody, if you haven't thought about this, is that return air duct is a big hole in the building. It connects the first floor to the downstream side of your intake damper, because chances are your, your uh, recirculation air damper is open okay, or nearly fully open. So it's a direct connection to the roof. Big hole in the building. On a day when the outdoor air temperature and the indoor air temperature are relatively the same, it's not really a big deal because there's no stack effect, all right? But in the winter time, when we have this cold, dense column of air outdoors that's pushing now up additional pressure on that return air duct, you're going, in this example, see a significant reduction in the outdoor air intake flow rate because you have more pressure on the downstream side. And in the summertime, it's exactly the opposite, except generally speaking, the offset and temperatures aren't as far apart. So um, winter stack problems are generally worse than summer stack problems. But if you take a look at this, it's not just high rises. Here, if I look at a 100 degree swing on a 70 foot high rise, I get that same 2 tenths of an inch change, all right? So that means that this, this you know, five-story building is going to be affected by seasonal variations in temperature. And if you just rely on a fixed intake damper, it's just not, it's not going to work very well for you, okay? Just like the wind, it's not going to work. In fact, these last two examples, I talk to test and balance professionals all the time about because I'm like, you folks go out, you set this up. Somebody comes back a few weeks later, checks your work, finds that, you know, they get a totally different reading. They think you didn't do a good job. Maybe you did a great job, 
maybe just the, uh, the, the conditions change. And it's very important for everybody to understand that, and it's really a reason why you need to provide active control. It's not just fan speed changes, okay? The other reason also has to do with, particularly on air handlers, is dampers, okay? We have damper problems. We have three major problems with dampers. We have hysteresis, which is the inability of the damper blades to always repeat the position. You might drive the drive shaft to the same exact position every time, but you have hysteresis in the linkage that makes the blades come back to a slightly different position. If you're relying on that position and that opening changes, the airflow rate is going to change. The same thing can be said about binding. Dampers bind all the time. So we have dampers that don't close properly, don't open properly. I've seen dampers that have bound up so bad the linkage is broken. Some blades remain open, some blades are closed, and yet all you're going by is damper position. The same thing is true with deterioration. You have seals that deteriorate, the openings change, the flow rate changes. But I'll hear people all the time say, all I need to do is look at my actuator position or get actuator feedback. That's it. That solves everything. It doesn't solve anything. It makes you feel good, but it doesn't solve anything. You could even have actuator drive shafts slipping and think you're, everything's perfect. It doesn't work that way, right? But we have so many buildings that are done this way. That's why we have so many problems, all right? And this is just damper history. This is from our building. And this is a Tamco damper. This is a high quality Tamco damper. And what you have here is you have, you, you'll see that the, um, the blue data set is we went from a closed or night set back to 15% open and measured the outdoor airflow rate. And then the red data set is we went from 100% economizer or fully open to 15% open and measured it. You get two distinct populations. Depending on whether you went from closed to 15% or open to 15%. And in this case here, it was close to 20% variation. And that's simply from hysteresis from the linkage. All right. This was all done in one day. There's no deterioration here, and there's no uh, damp or seal failure or you know deterioration there. Okay, so um, you know, there's no no binding, no nothing. All right, so what's the, what's the deal? Okay, well, when you look at the intake flow rate variations, we have the system induced, which are the fan speed variations, which a lot of people recognize. We have the damper induced, um, which not enough people seem to recognize, even though anybody in the industry that's been in the industry knows it's a problem. And then we have the environmental induced, which is wind and stack effect, which just too many people ignore, all right? And as a result, you have all these variations. And I leave one out that I could have talked about, but, uh, you know, it could have been filter loading, too. You know, that's another problem that creates, creates, creates problems in some of these systems. So, you know, when you take a look at this, when we look at an uncontrolled outdoor air intake, what you'll find is these system effects, damper issues, and environmental factors, they're going to put you in a position where I don't care how good you set up that flow in the beginning, you're going to get at least plus or minus 50% uncertainty on that measurement, and that's not acceptable. And the fact of the matter is, on a lot of these systems, the intakes are so difficult to measure in the field uh, that test and balance is going to have additional uncertainty that could be 25% or more. So really, we have big problems, all right? And that's a fact. And we really need to address these big problems. And so the logical conclusion to me has been, these system effects, damper issues, and environmental issues point you to measure the outdoor airflow rates, at least come up with some way to determine the outdoor airflow rates. But uh, if you just do that, you're going to end up that you're going to be an alarm. And you're going to be an alarm all the time. I tell people all the time, if you buy an outdoor airflow meter and you put it in measure, it, measure and just alarm with it, you better put the alarm somewhere where um, nobody's going to see it or hear it because you're going to be an alarm all the time. All right. Uh, really what you want to do here is you want to control it. That's really the argument that you should be making to any, everybody. You need to do it. And um, what we're going to do in the next uh, presentation is 
we say measure or determine the outdoor airflow rates. In the next presentation, we're going to look at, you know, what are your options for doing that? Do you have to directly measure it or are there other, are there other options? And we want to look at those. But it's on everything. It's all outdoor air intakes. That's the end of part one. In part two, we're going to talk about making the case for direct outdoor airflow measurement. So I'll see you in part two.